I guess we can move on. So far, what we have been doing was looking for better architectures. Now, this is one of the papers that is thinking outside of the box. Can you actually look for your data augmentation or search for a better data augmentation process and automate that? So that's a big picture. And we know that data augmentation matters a lot. We saw it. It's kind of double or triple the size of your data. And the more data you have, the more your neural networks are going to like it. Intuitively, what data augmentation does is going to teach your model about the invariances in your data. For instance, those random croppings, it's going to tell your model that if I take that image, the image of a dog, shift it to the right, left, up, down, it should still be classified as a dog. That's what that translation is doing. And this is one of the invariances that are good in your data and you want to discover it. And there is also another observation trying to motivate why would you do uh, automatic augmentation of your data is that each data is going to have its own data augmentation. For instance, on CIFAR 10 or ImageNet, flipping the image, I mean, looking at your image in the mirror, is a very good and effective data augmentation because a tiger, if you look at it in a mirror, it is still a tiger. But MNIST, flipping the image is not a good idea for your data augmentation because a number two is going to end up being something that doesn't look like a number anymore, okay? Or seven, maybe it's good for eight, for nine, it's gonna give you a different number. So each one is gonna have its own augmentation policy. But the algorithm is the same as before. You have a controller RNN, which is gonna give you a strategy for your augmentation. This is an RNN, which is gonna select between a bunch of operation types with what probability you're gonna choose that operation and how much, what should be the magnitude of that operation. You select that, you train your neural network using this data augmentation, you get an accuracy, and then you keep updating your controller. What is your search space? What is the search space of all the data augmentation possible? Let's break down your policy apart. Let's have a policy that is gonna consist of five sub-policies. Okay, so we just did nothing. A policy is five sub-policies. Each sub-policy, itself has two operations in it, and you're gonna apply them in a sequence, okay? That's your sub-policy, and each operation has two hyperparameters. With what probability are you actually gonna do it? Maybe you flip a coin. Maybe you first say that I want to do a random crop of my image, but then you flip a coin deciding whether I should do it or no. And then if you decide that you want to do it, what should be the size of your crop? Okay, so you have a policy, it has five sub-policies, each sub-policy has two operations in it. And then even if you decide on an operation, there is a chance that you might not do it. With some probability, you, you might decide that you are not going to do that operation. And for every image in your mini-batch, you are going to choose a sub-policy uniformly at random. You had five choices here. Uniformly at random, you're going to choose one of them, which is a sequence of two operations. I think it's going to be clear here. That's your original image. You have a sequence of five sub-policies. And once you're searching for your optimal controller, or once you're searching for your optimal uh, augmentation, you're going to apply only one of these. You're not going to do all five in a sequence. You're just going to do one of them. And what are your choices? For instance, you can use equalize, or you decide to rotate. With this probability, you're going to rotate and then the rotation magnitude is eight, or you can equalize, solarize, posterize, equalize, rotate. Where are these coming from? I'm sure some of you were using the PIL package. It's a Python image library package. And this is gonna give, give you a list of uh, augmentations that you can do on your images. For instance, do some shear in the X direction, in the Y direction, translate the image in the X direction, Y direction, rotate it, adjust the contrast, invert, equalize. And in, in addition to that, you can have cut out, which is you take a portion of your image and then you mask it. It is similar to random erasing. In total, you're gonna have 16 operations that you can choose from, but then there is a problem here. The magnitude of these operations is a continuous variable. We want to discretize that. How do you discretize it? You put a uniform spacing grid with 10 points. And the magnitude is a zero to 10 number. 
I think it's from one to 10. And then you're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six, up until 10. So you have 10 choices here. And as you can see, you, you got an eight here for the magnitude. We can discrete the prob the, discretize the probability. That one is also a continuous number. We can discretize it into 11 values from zero up until one. In total, for a sub policy, you're gonna have these many choices. It's gonna be 16 times 10 times 11 to the power two because you have two sub policies, two operations per sub policy. And in total, you have five sub policies. It's gonna be five times two, it's gonna give you 10, 10 to the power 32 total number of policies. And that's why you're gonna need the controller because this is a combinatorially uh, huge space to explore. And then your search algorithm is a combination of your recurrent neural network, which is gonna give you 30 in total softmax predictions and then some uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. So we are not gonna have time to go through that. We're gonna do it next semester, but this is a policy optimization algorithm. So it's not a big deal what algorithm you choose, but then you're not done. You find your auto, auto augmentation policy after this process, after, after you manage to train your controller, you are not done. You are gonna choose not only the best policy, but five of your best policies. And each, sub, each policy had five sub-policies. In total, that's gonna give you 25 sub-policies. So out of this process, you're gonna end up with five policies. Each of them has five sub-policies and that's gonna give you 25. And when you're actually training for one final round on your data set, you're gonna choose one of these at random from 25. So while you are training your RNN, you were choosing among five sub policies at random uniformly while actually training for one final round. You are going to choose with probability one over 25, one of these sub policies. And then you can do auto augment directly on the data set that you have at hand. For instance, for CIFAR 10, you want to find the best policy for augmentation. For MNIST, you want to find the best policy. And then you're going to use auto direct or you want to do some transfer. Maybe you find an auto augmentation policy for CIFAR 10, and then you want to transfer it to ImageNet. Do the same operations on ImageNet. You can use it for both. And this and CIFAR 10 is gonna end up being a proxy task for ImageNet. I think I'm gonna stop here and answer questions. There is one in the chat already. It says, is it possible to change the range of magnitude as we start to learn with which magnitudes are best for instance, we start with magnitudes from one to five, but we find that value five works best. So now we want to adjust the range to try six to see if going up in value continues to work. We can actually do that. And this paper is not doing it, but you can do it. In principle, you should be fine. Maybe initially the range for the magnitude was from one to 10 for some of your operations. But then throughout the process, you're going to figure out that you need to focus around five. And then you can put a grid on that. That should be fine. Okay. Any other questions? So this is cool. Not only you can find your best architecture, you can find the best augmentation policy for your data. So any other questions? So there is a little bit of confusion in the chat about how do you actually use your recurrent neural network and proximal policy optimization. And that's actually not that difficult the process. But before I answer your question, I want to say for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. For those of you who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. So how are things working? Your controller is going to output a probability. What should be the probability of choosing shear versus choosing translate versus choosing rotate? Not only that, your controller is going to tell you what is the probability of applying a shear with magnitude eight. And even further, it's gonna tell you, it's gonna choose shear with probability 0 0.8 versus another probability with a magnitude of eight. So that's what is coming out of your recurrent run network. It's a choice between all of these options. And then let's count how many choices we have. You have five sub policies. Each sub policy has three choices, one, two, three. So it's gonna be three times five. 15, and each sub policy has two operations in it. So it's gonna be two times 15, and that's gonna give you your 30 softmax. So you're gonna have a sequence 
what is going to come out of your RNN is a sequence of 30 softmaxes, which is going to give you your probability of choosing one versus the other. Now that, now that you have a neural network, which is your controller, you need to train it. To train it, you need to interact with your environment. You need to collect data. What is your environment? You need to say, if I sample this augmentation policy from my recurrent neural network, how good? How good did I do? What is my reward? And your reward is basically your validation accuracy. As soon as you know your reward, you're going to be able to update the parameters of your controller. In the first slide of uh, this session, or the topics about AutoML, we cover the very simple reinforcement learning algorithm, which is that you're going to look at your reward, subtract the baseline, and then take the gradient of the log of those probabilities. We can use that for your for trying to optimize your controller, or we can use a more fancy version. So this is just a fancier version of an algorithm, reinforcement learning algorithm. That's all we are doing. So you don't need to know the details of proximal policy optimization now. So was everything clear now? Okay, perfect. Any other questions?